Good afternoon. Welcome to the Arvada Center for the Arts and Humanities. My name is Philip Sneed, and I'm pleased to serve as executive director here. And um, in case there's anybody who doesn't know why we're here or the background to this, um, it was 25 years ago yesterday that more than 70 armed FBI agents, along with EPA agents, um, raided the plant at Rocky Flats, probably the only time in US history when the government raided itself. So um, we have had a, a couple of really interesting panels so far, and now we go into our next panel, which is about secrecy. And um, we were having a discussion about this panel just over lunch just before this. And um, one of the ironies of this panel, of course, is that there are people on this panel who have things that they can't say because they're secret. So um, this is a panel about secrecy in which we can't quite say everything that we would like to say. Um, so I hope you'll appreciate the, the comic and dramatic irony of that situation. Uh, but of course, there are many things that can be said. Uh, before I turn this over, I just would like to um, once again uh, offer some thanks to the people that and organizations that are responsible for this. Um, but first, I'd like to draw your attention, if you haven't seen it already, to the exhibition that's downstairs in our uh, history museum. It's called Rocky Flats in History, Art, and Memory, and um, <clears throat> it's a it's it's a it's uh, something that was uh, created for us by our part, one of our partners, the Rocky Flats Institute and Museum. Um, that's a wonderful organization and they really need your help and uh, we're in danger of losing them as an organization and, and as a repository for the exhibition and curation of, um, of Rocky Flats history. So um, I think it's really important to uh, support them if you possibly can. Um, their uh, board and volunteers include many workers from the former plant, one of whom is on the panel with us today. I would also like to thank our primary sponsor, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and John and Carol Balcom, without whose support this, would event, this event would not be possible. Our partners, the Rocky Flats Institute and Museum, and the Center of the American West at CU Boulder. And of course, the Carnegie Library's Maria Rogers Oral History Program in Boulder. And in fact, our moderator today, Dorothy Charlo, um, is uh, from them and initiated the program in uh, oral history um, where they recorded um, a, a number of people, workers and others who were involved in the history of Rocky Flats. Um, last, uh, thanks to the, uh, of course, the city of Arvada from whom we enjoy generous support as well as the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. And I'd like to thank the uh, staff, my staff at the Arvada Center and all of the artists and panelists um, who have contributed much to make this possible. So without any further ado, I will turn this over to Dorothy Charlo. Can you hear me? Well, I just had a little something uh, that I wanted to start out with. Uh, when we were interviewing uh, people from Rocky Flats, uh, I noticed that the people that had been there many, many years called it the Flats. And the people that hadn't been there very long, or the government people, or the politicians called it uh, Rocky. So, and I just recently had an experience of talking with someone who works for the company that we know of as Kaiser Hill that did the closure of Rocky Flats. Uh, it's actually CH2M Hill. And she was telling me that um, the CH2M Hill, Kaiser Hill, had done some work uh, in London for the 2012 Olympics. Uh, and uh, so when they went there from the Den Denver office and said that uh, they were Kaiser Hill, the London people said, oh, oh, that's just wonderful. You know, you have so much to offer us. We just really need you. And the people from Kaiser Hill were a little puzzled by that. You know, wh what's Rocky Flats got to do with the Olympics in London? And then someone said, well, you know, the British, they talk about apartments as flats. So they actually thought that Rocky Flats was a large apartment complex in the, in the West. So uh, I'm here to, to say we have transparency now, and we all know that that's not the case. So, um, I want to just briefly inter, uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, John Lipsky, Lipsky is from, uh, as, as you may know from the morning, he's the lead person from the FBI. Nat Mueller is uh, one of the early, if not the first, uh, EPA regulators uh, that went into Rocky Flats. Um, Judy Danielson uh, did some very early activist work with the American Friends Service Committee. And Ken Freiberg, Freiberg, Freiberg okay, is a long-term Rocky Flats worker. Um, 
I'm going to, the structure of the panel is going to be uh, this. I'm going to ask each of, of us, starting with Ken, to talk for about five minutes uh, about, you know, what their particular involvement in Rocky Flats uh, has been. And so we'll each have five minutes to do that. And then um, I'm going to use, I, I hope that most of you have in your hands a handout uh, that gives excerpts uh, from the oral histories. Uh, and we're going to use that as sort of a springboard for discussion. And we'll be going through, probably won't get to all of the quotes, but we're going to use that to just kind of delve into the issue of secrecy at Rocky Flats. I wanted to just uh, point out that there's lots of uh, panels and discussions that are going on this weekend, and probably many of you have been to some already. Um, we want to really try to focus on the secrecy angle in this one. Uh, and I may need to uh, divert any particular meanderings that may get way off the topic uh, to direct you to the other panels. Um, so after, we're going to be sure and leave a few minutes at the end for each of us to say some final words. And then we'll have 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers from, from the audience. And uh, we look forward to that. So I think I'll take my turn for 15 minutes just to kind of set the stage and tell you about, um, first of all, how, how I got involved in Rocky Flats. Um, I, I have been a volunteer with the Boulder Library's Oral History Program, which is centered at the uh, Carnegie Branch uh, for Local History in Boulder. Um, I might also say I, I have had a lifelong fear of and interest in uh, nuclear weapons. And so as I began to volunteer and do oral histories uh, with this uh, library program, uh, I was simultaneously aware that Rocky Flats was uh, closing and that we had this opportunity uh, to interview, to get on tape, uh, in actual video in many cases, uh, oral histories with uh, workers, long-term workers from Rocky, Rocky Flats, as well as a whole range of activists. So I started doing that. Uh, I took courage in hand and called up a couple of retired workers. And uh, I was thinking they probably will say, no, I can't talk to you because of security regulations. And to my surprise, they said, sure, I'll talk to you. And of course, it turns out that they know exactly what they can talk about and what they can't. And that's dinned into them that Ken will be telling us about that. At any rate, um, after I had been doing this for a short while, I got in touch with the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum, which was just starting then, uh, starting their work. And uh, we set up an oral history committee so that the museum could explore getting more oral histories than, than just one person could do. Uh, we, we got a grant uh, that uh, actually indicated that if we uh, talked about the buildings of the Rocky Flats complex, uh, we would be able to get money from the Colorado Historical Society since the buildings were going to be torn down. So we interpreted that pretty liter liberally, and um, some of the people that um, were activists uh, were also interviewed in that way. We, so we ended up interviewing not only workers, but a broad representation of people, peace, environmental, community safety activists, regulators, key community leaders, and politicians. When I think back to our committee meetings, I think we all had the sense that this plant represented a huge piece of history, and that if all that was left after the plant closed were the documents and the press releases, uh, we would have missed uh, a, a, a huge piece of the human history. One of the things we discovered is that although many people thought there were just two points of view, that of the workers or that of the protesters, in fact, there were many, many different points of view. Um, workers had many different experiences and perceptions and points of view. 
uh, activists had a whole range of um, interests and concerns and didn't necessarily have one perspective. And of course, the regulators and the politicians had their own set of concerns. At any rate, we now have uh, more than 150 oral histories that are ar archived in the Carnegie Library, and they are all also uh, online. We, we were fortunate in that we had a professionally trained um, program manager, Susan Becker, who has managed to work with the collaboration between the museum and the uh, Carnegie Library. And so um, every, just about all of the oral histories pertaining to Rocky Flats are online. And uh, you can see, you can find the access uh, on the handout sheet. It's on the back side so that any of you that want to explore these oral histories can do, do so. Now, I think I've had my five minutes. So I'm going to turn this over to Ken now. And Ken, would you tell us about what it was like to work? Uh, I found out about Rocky Flats when I was still in the service of the Air Force in 1952. So I put my application into Rocky Flats and started work at Rocky Flats in the 1st of July, 1953. I spent the next 25 years in health physics, which was mainly to protect the personnel, the environment, and et cetera, uh, from the radiation, from contamination, and et cetera, for the soil, air, water, and et cetera. I did that for the next 25 years. Along came a building called 371, which was the new 371, 374, was the new plutonium recovery facility to replace 771, that was at that time about 25, 30 years old or more. And in turn, what we did then is I went and they, Rockwell left Rocky Flats, correction, Dow left Rocky Flats, Rockwell came in and they, most of the team that was on the 371 building went and were offered jobs at Midland, Michigan with Dow, including myself. They asked me to stay and take charge of the 371 as a program manager, which I did and spent the next five years finishing the building. After that, I turned the building over to the operations group, which was Jack Weaver here that uh, was at the panel yesterday. And I went on to building, uh, first off, plant services for a while, which was about 600 people that supported the plant. And then I went from there, they put me in charge of facility projects, which was all projects on the plant site, mainly engineering and construction. I went from there and we needed a new manufacturing uh, manufacturing facility primarily for stainless steel. We put that together and we put it together on a design build with a team that in turn actually put the building together in 37% under budget and two years ahead of schedule and it was the way we should have been most of the buildings. But in turn, after that, uh, that building was extremely successful and after that what I did is I went and they put me into facility projects again for a short time and then I went in charge of maintenance, utilities, and plant services. There was about 1,600 people. In reference to the secrecy, uh, when I first came to Rocky Flats, uh, everything was dirt roads. The parking lots, there was only two parking lots. They were outside of the security fence of the plant. You walked into the security area, either at 81 building or at 11 building, and you changed your badge. They inspected your badge quite thoroughly, and then you either walked or took a bus to the various buildings that you were assigned to. Everybody at that time, except health physics, security, and the fire department, was restricted to basically one building or one compartment in the building, primarily for the secrecy. The secrecy was when you got into the building, you again showed your badge, changed badge, and then you went inside the building, changed it into different clothing, and then you went into the back area where the production was done. The production was done primarily in the back areas, and that was a separate area. They were the hot areas, as we called them, and only a few people were allowed in each of the areas. Uh, nobody was supposed to talk to each other in reference to, whether it was in a carpool, whether it was a cafeteria, or wherever you were, in reference to the secrecy of the product that we were making and the equipment that we were using. There was never any secrecy put on me or any of my people saying that we couldn't give the environmental data, the, uh, all of the water data, the air sampling data, 
the vegetation, the soil, and et cetera. That was always open to us and open to the public, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I was never given any restrictions on that type of data. The only data that was to be maintained secret was in turn with the product itself and the equipment that was making that product and the numbers and things of this nature. It worked quite well over the period of years and I think one of the main reasons was that the Russians during the end of the World War II start putting a lot of people on what they call the Manhattan Project. There was a total of at least 350 or more Americans that were spying, so to speak, in reference to obtaining data for Russia of nuclear data. And as a result, from my understanding, they actually exploded their first nuclear weapons like two or three years ahead of schedule because of data that leaked. And the data that the government and the company did not want us to release was, as I say again, the data that was secret to the product or the equipment that made the product and the numbers. Uh, after that, uh, I just went on my normal business, and in turn, I'm still working for DOE off and on right now, and uh, it works quite well, but the secrecy is still remaining the same. We can talk about the environmental data, but not the product data, and that's all I'll say. Judy? Um, my parents, Dorothy and Carl, were uh, Lutheran ministers and missionaries. And uh, I grew up with very strong moral values, and I believe my country held those same values. Uh, I went to college, became a physical therapist, and worked in the US. And then I got a job with Lutheran World Relief, uh, doing physical therapy with Vietnamese people during the war in Vietnam. Uh, we had language school and, uh, before we started, and we uh, could speak to people then. Uh, I made many friends. I uh, talked to many people. I found out, including soldiers, um, I found out that some of the people I met had been imprisoned in prisons that the U.S. military said had been closed after the French uh, colonial occupation and torture of people. But these friends said they had been tortured in these very prisons and U.S. military were uh, part of that torturing process. Um, that was very challenging to my values. I also knew soldiers and they uh, were quite clear and we could see that the story on the ground was not the same as the story being told in Washington. The U.S. was losing this war. And uh, so I came home knowing, knowing about lies and, and uh, secrets, but rather traumatized by that. I moved to Denver in 1971 um, this was soon after Dr. Edward Martell had written his uh, core sample studies about the 1969 fire at Rocky Flats that really uh, finally told people in the area that there was this plant here and it was rather dangerous. And um, we, we took, uh, with a group called uh, Clergy and Lady Concerned About Vietnam and basically concerned about war and nuclear weapons. We went out and uh, in households near Arvada, um, we knocked on people's doors and asked if they would like their soil tested because uh, news of the fire had come out and people were very happy. This was before 9-11. Very happy to have us go in their backyard, take a little spoon, scoop it into a baggie and some of the topsoil and uh, put their address in it. And we took suitcases of these baggies to uh, the candidates running for election for Congress in 1972 and asked that they uh, have these baggies tested and get back to the homeowners. Uh, we didn't follow up very well, and I don't think anyone ever got any results. But that was my first experiential awareness of the plant. Um, in 1974, a wonderful woman, Pam Solo, and I were hired by the American Friends Service Committee, which is a, um, a Quaker peace and justice organization, pacifist organization, and um, very much working against the Vietnam War. But uh, we also were very aware of our experience working on Rocky Flat stuff, and we uh, formed a coalition with Environmental Action of Colorado and 
a number of other organizations and individuals called uh, the Rocky Flats Action Group. First it was a coalition, then the action group. And our first concern was to really do some research because this plant, even though uh, they say they release data, who read it and who knew about this plant? And we uh, eventually came up with a, we thought, a very readable little brochure called Local Hazard Global Threat. Uh, we were quite aware, I think, uh, most of us who lived in the 50s of the global threat of nuclear war um, after the bombs were dropped on Japan and uh, had hidden under our desks. We uh, knew that, um, well, President Johnson had said 400 nuclear bombs could destroy the entire Soviet Union, which was most of Northern Europe and Asia. And uh, we knew that this could be ta catastrophic to the environment and to life on Earth. So the global threat was pretty clear. But the local hazard, we felt, was, had been very secret. Uh, until 55, nobody even knew that this was an, a bomb plant out there. In 1969 was really the first sense that there might be danger to the population after Mar Dr. Martel's studies. And uh, we wanted to find out a whole lot more we were also very concerned about uh, the reason that we were building these bombs. Um, of course, it was uh, the national security policy of mutual assured destruction. It seemed insane. And uh, we wanted to make con contacts with the whole complex of uh, uh, plants in this, in this country that made parts for the bomb and assembled the bombs. and. Uh, uh, created a nuclear weapons facilities task force of people that live near these plants who wanted to organize. Um, we, uh, we had a lot of fun doing it, but we also learned that there were many secrets and uh, made a lot of contacts with people all through our, our uh, metropolitan area here had a lot of contacts. We made, we had demonstrations at the plant numerous times, every 16 to 20. We had uh, uh, conferences. We had meetings with the health department. We met with Rockwell officials. We had scientists on board. We met with Dr. Martell, Dr. Johnson, many people. We really did educate ourselves and try to go out into the public and uh, make sure that everyone knew that they lived near this plant. Nat, would you like to go next? Thank you very much. My name is Nat Mulo, and I currently work for the Environmental Protection Agency. My connection to Rocky Flats was that early um, in, the, in the 80s, I was assigned as one of the first regional project managers to the Rocky Mountain Arsenal facility, which is on the east side of Denver and was run by Shell Chemical Corporation and the U.S. Army. That was a weapons depot and weapons manufacturing depot mostly focused on nerve agent. And that was a situation where the environmental laws in this country were just being formulated um, during those years for implementation of managing of hazardous wastes. And uh, we spent um, the agency with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment spent several years working with, some would, would say arguing with, and debating with the Army and Shell Chemical Corporation, various jurisdictional status of what was it that the state of Colorado could regulate, what was it that EPA could regulate, and what was it that uh, Shell Chemical Corporation and the United States Army felt we should have nothing to do with regulating them because they were doing just fine on their own. That jurisdictional battle was sort of worked out uh, about the time that more awareness about Rocky Flats was coming into the public eye. And our leadership at EPA said, well, you know, we need somebody who can take on these thorny, thorny jurisdictional issues. And they uh, came to me and said, we need another regional project manager to work on Rocky Flats because we think we're going to have similar jurisdictional 
uh, and authority discussions with them that you had with the arsenal and you seem to do okay there and the state of Colorado was happy with what you did there so could you please take on this project and I thought for a little while do I really want to do that boy it was really a hassle to to work on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal I had to get a DOD security clearance because I was not allowed into certain areas to oversee some of the activity and do the work that I felt I had to do as an independent health and safety and environmental protection entity um, and I started thinking gee I wonder what that would would entail and of course I I went to ask some of the experts in the area and one of them was my father who uh, was uh, a veteran of World War II United States Air Force and a Cold War warrior and veteran as well he was responsible for an awful lot of work in the Cold War with the United States Air Force Air Force and knew a lot about security clearances because it was his job not only to work with the Air Force during that time to to do security clearances but he also was in charge of the contractor who processed all of the security information for Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado Springs so I asked him gee dad what do you think I'm in for and he said well I don't know much about the plant but this is what I think they did and back in 1960s when they were were building Cheyenne Mountain they told us about that that area I think you probably are in for a lot more than you can handle and maybe you should turn down the honor <laughs> well he was my dad and of course we sometimes do what they say and sometimes in rebellion do just the opposite so I chose to do just the opposite what I uh, since there are so many anecdotes and stories that that John and I share and so many at, at who I met who are really wonderful people at the plant and very dedicated conscientious hard-working people could share with you but since this is about secrecy I'll stick to that point um, I quickly realized that there was probably a lot going on at the plant as I made my first introductions to the Department of Energy staff and the contractors for Rockwell International that I would never be able to know because the National Securities Act was a very strictly followed rule and uh, had some very severe penalties if anyone were to go astray of following it to the letter. It had a lot of requirements that had to be met and uh, I soon learned that none of the people at the plant were, were going to get themselves into trouble just to let me know what they thought was going on that EPA might or the Colorado Department of Health might be able to help them or inspire their leadership to pay more attention to or put more resource to. So I um, decided to apply for a security clearance and uh, the security clearance process there, the highest clearance that one could receive is one uh, with the, the letter Q under the Department of Energy for nuclear materials and weapons. And oddly enough, um, they they did the background checks and there was some delay and I was feeling pressure because there was a lot of public pressure and scrutiny on what EPA was doing to to hold the facility accountable to its own promises that it was making to other individuals that they were doing the best that they could do doing a really good job on monitor, monitoring environmental impacts um, I just felt like I was getting a lot of questions from the activists, from the news media, and from citizens who were just very, very concerned that I could not answer. So I pursued the security clearance, and um, it was a long process back then, not as long as it is now, for lots of reasons of backlogs and uh, costs. Um, but it was still taking a little too long. I think it was about the second month that I was waiting and getting a little anxious and nervous, still couldn't answer these questions. So um, I wrote a letter of inquiry on status and I got a form letter back from the Department of Energy uh, that it was under process and that it could take about you know, six, seven months maybe to get that done. And then I wrote another letter saying, uh, oh, and in this letter that I got back, they said, and you'll have to just wait because there are a lot of potential employees and workers ahead of you in the queue and I thought oh, they don't get it I'm not an employee I'm an independent reviewer and, and regulatory agency so I wrote another letter back to the headquarters office that processed the security clearances and I said I am not your employee I'm not an employee of the Department of Energy I am an independent overview agency and my duties are being impaired by your slowing up my security clearance 
Two weeks later, I had the clearance. Then I had to go through some training, and the Department of Energy and the contractors were very good at training you on what the National Security Act contained and what you had to do, what your responsibilities were, and what you could say, and what you couldn't say, and what you could do, and what you couldn't do. And I thought, oh, that's, that's important. I should really pay attention to that. And I went again back to the expert, talked to my dad about those provisions, and he said, now you know why I never talk at home. <laughs> and it's true, it was a complaint in the family. He was a very quiet man. What I found, um, even after getting the security clearance, it was that there was this provision on the National Securities Act called need to know. And there's very few individuals who have any knowledge about that law who would, um, who would really want to put their families and their careers or even the security of the nation at risk by saying something inadvertently that was unintentional that could violate that law or put them in a, in a, in a position of compromise over the country. So uh, one of the most legendary stories about my situation is I was the first uh, independent oversight person from the Environmental Protection Agency to go into one of these plants. I had a colleague near in, o in Ohio near the Fernald plant who was going through the same process and catching up to uh, where we were on Rocky Flats and going through the same security clearance issues. But need to know led to things like even though I had a security clearance, I had the training, um, they just weren't sure what they could and couldn't show me. So at times, they would lead me through areas that I was responsible in, in partnership with the health department to do independent oversight. And before I'd walk into the room or the building, they'd stop me and say, Nat, sorry about this, but we have to put a blindfold on you before you inspect the area. <laughs> and that actually did happen a couple of times. Uh, over time, we were able to overcome that uh, and, and, and come to understandings that um, they could trust us to a certain extent at the health department and at EPA, not to reveal information that was of a national security interest. And I, I think there was a lot of interpretation of what is and what would be and what should be. And um, I think that history will show, as it has shown with so many things, that what we think might be top secret and secret at the moment, just out of prudence for our own safety and the safety of others, time will allow us to reveal. And um, I'm in, this secrecy issue and access to environmental and human health data is fascinating to me because here we are 25 years later and on all the panels, people who have not seen each other for years are getting together and sharing stories and, and because of the secrecy issue or because of the legal liability of a, of a criminal investigation when this young gentleman came to my office many years ago and said, I need to talk to you. <laughs> in his black suit and white shirt and shiny black shoes. And I asked him where he was from and he said, I'm from the FBI. <laughs> and it's quite a serious matter. I said, wow, this is gonna get even more interesting now. <laughs> I think with all those layers of confidentiality that we build onto situations like this and the responsibility we take on, um, there's going to be an awful lot of confusion and even 25 years hence, even with the oral histories, a, a really great project, we still don't know the truth. And I think um, we should probably shorten the time it takes us to get to that truth. Thank you. With that good lead in, John, would you pick it up? Tough act to follow. <laughs> My name is John Lipsky, and I was the affiant for the search warrant affidavit at Rocky Flats on June 6, 1989. I was an FBI agent for about five years and 35 years old at the time. And I'm married. My wife, Patricia, is somewhere in here, I hope. And we'll be married for 40 years in August. I have three daughters, and I have two grandchildren. Just a little bio. And um, Nat put it so eloquently, but um, it's hard to add anything to it. But with anything in life, there's always a balance, I think. And the balance of having a security clearance 
you also have the burden of maintaining it. And for an example, Robert Hansen, he was an FBI agent that um, sold secrets to the Soviet Union, then Russia, and uh, I think it was in 2001, just before 9-11, he was arrested and he pled guilty for the rest of his life um, for treason. A lot of people died because of the FBI agent that turned traitor. And what was important is that he had the burden of, or the Bureau, the FBI had to maintain his security clearance and then also Mr. Hansen was supposed to do some things. And he was able to avert a polygraph investigation, a lot of other things, it's just amazing. And where, I, where this all comes from is, as Nat mentioned, the NSA, or National Security Act of 47, there was also the 1947 loyalty agreement for federal employees. Anyone ever hear of the Truman Loyalty Agreement? There's a few of you. And um, it's always good to greet somebody with their hand or, or give them a hug, but the government has the ability to grab you by the gonads if they don't like you. And it's like the trigger of fear is to pull your security clearance. So you have a job that you can go to, and of course there's performance measurements for that. But if there's another problem, they can pull your security clearance for whatever reason. And that's always held over uh, employees' heads. And every five years, a person with a security clearance is supposed to go through a reinvestigation. Now that's what Hansen didn't do, and it turned out that after the internal investigation, the FBI wasn't in enforcing the rules. So I've always wondered, well, why do we have security clearances and when we don't follow the rules to enforce them? And in particular with Rocky Flats, with so much, you know, locked up in the courthouse with the grand jury documents, two years ago I, Freedom of Information Act, requested the EPA's Office of Criminal Investigation file that I worked with, and I was denied access to anything because the EPA said that it's an ongoing investigation. So it's like, okay, well, when the government commits a crime or lies, why doesn't some kind of um, accountability occur? Because I don't know of any ongoing investigation at Rocky Flats, so go out there and look. There's a cool site where you can do an over, overflight get an overflight video of the place. There's no buildings out there. It's a super fun site in the middle of an area that they, the Park Service wants to let you have ac access to. So it's really important to understand this CEPA, uh, Classified Information Protection Act um, information. And if you saw the, uh, the interview with Ed Snowden and uh, Channel or NBC News went out to Russia to meet with him and talk to him and Snowden said he would never get to, he will never answer to the music because he will never be able to make a public statement about his trial if he were ever captured is somewhat true because there's a little thing called SEPA trial, Classified Information Pro uh, Procedures Act trial. So you, the person would still get a quote, fair trial. As Judge Kerrigan said one time in the courtroom, a federal judge, he said, life's not fair, but you'll have a fair trial in my courtroom. And even with the CEPA procedures implemented, that means that the jury has to be read into the National Security Act and, and uh, the courtroom's closed. Nothing can be shared. Kind of reminds me of what happened to Mr. McKay's and his uncle's uh, lawsuit out at uh, Rocky Flats in the 70s. It was a closed hearing. Everything was um, kept quiet. And uh, this is what was uh, threatened about Rocky Flats with Rockwell. If Rock, Rockwell had gone to trial, it would have been a SEPA trial. So it would have been closed. And everything would have been classified. And uh, come to the, you know, I'll kind of finish that up. Um, I had a lot of clearances and uh, I did a lot of things. And uh, I'm under the obligation where I can't talk about some things um, because my government trusts me. I guess they decided they, that, that that could happen. But with Rocky Flats, there's also some limitations that I can talk about as well. And it's like, why can't we talk that way? You know, when we're talking to somebody, why is it always, if I tell you that, 
I'm going to have to kill you. You know, it's a, you know, it's a great TV line, but why isn't, you know, it, we, we, when I worked intelligence for uh, uh, the White House Office, Office of Drug Control, National Drug Control Policy, we found, we had pictures of tunnels between Mexico and the U.S. that we couldn't share with our local counterparts because they didn't have a security clearance. And I, wor I worked with a uh, sergeant from the Orange County Sheriff's Department in California, and we talked about, and I called, made some calls to headquarters, so what we did is the Orange County Sheriff guy was able, what, had a security clearance. And he went back to our headquarters and got read in, and then we were able to share that information with the locals who didn't have a sec uh, security clearance. So it's like, why can't we figure these things out? I, I just don't know. Um, the property owners that uh, sued in January of 1990, six months after the raid, finally went to court in 2005. And uh, I was a subject matter expert in that uh, trial for the plaintiffs. And the lawyer wanted me to go to the Front Range Community College to go to the then Rocky Flats reading room. I really re regretted going until I got there. And uh, I was thinking about what Nat said, need to know, and then there's right to know, and then there's levels like law enforcement sensitive, and then there's confidential, secret, top secret. Uh, and then it goes beyond into uh, beyond that. And uh, John, I wonder if we can get back to some. Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Thank you. Anyway, um, so I got to the Rocky Flats um, or the Front Range Community College and the reading room there has the 1987 Waste Stream Identification and Characterization Reports. And they're all marked UCNI, Unclassified Nuclear Information. And that's one of the pitfalls when I met with Matt. And, uh, but I was able to take some of the the volumes back over the FBI because we were a top secret uh, outfit, so it was no problem. But here it, here it is at the Front Range Community College. And so we took about six boxes to copy and we prepared a bunch of uh, motions and exhibits for the trial, the property suit. And when they were filed, the Department of Energy intervened and said, uh, excuse us, but uh, we have a problem here. And uh, they forgot to take off the UCNI or unclassified nuclear information tags, so they uh, were allowed to do that, and then we refiled our uh, motions and, and exhibits. The overclassification is just amazing. Um, I wonder if we can get back into the weeds of Rocky Flats. <laughs> well, that was because uh, Ken had mentioned that um, all of the environmental information was open to the public, and this was a, a consequence of a EPA. Colorado Department of Health action to get Rocky Flats in compliance with the law and part of that was this waste stream identification and characterization and it was a lot of volumes of it and in 26 or maybe 39 I forget six inch binders and uh, it was not open to the public so it's it's that's that's the point I was making is um, there's a lot to navigate through with classified secrecy. If we can get back to some of the basics about uh, classification and need to know and compartmentalization, these are sort of basic concepts that um, Rocky Flats and all the other nuclear uh, in, uh, plants had to go by. They were set up that way. And yet I think for those of us who are not expert in it, we don't really understand is something classified one time and not classified another time. I just wanted to read uh, this uh, one uh, chemical engineer from Rocky Flats. He says, the plant was very compartmentalized. A lot of that was intentional based upon the concept of security at that time. They really preferred that most people did not know all aspects of the operation. They really wanted for security purposes to keep it compartmentalized. Uh, I think maybe uh, Ken, you might like to speak to that, and Nat and John. Uh, I'll speak to it, and what I'm hearing up front is a lot of bureaucracy. I worked out there from day one till we closed the plant. I knew what I was told was secret and what I could release. I was informed. I went through a lot of indoctrinations. I did that the same way in the Air Force. I, there was never a question in my mind what I could talk about and what I couldn't. 
I made jokes about things like I was a bus driver to a lot of my family. But in turn, in all seriousness, the things that were secret were the things that pertain to the product and the equipment that made the product and the numbers and et cetera. I never personally, and none of my people that I'm aware of, were told or were given the indication that we couldn't turn over to EPA or the federal government or the State Department, and I met with them a lot. In turn, anything to do with the environment, as I mentioned earlier, with the water, soil, vegetation, or anything else. And there was a lot of rumbles and rumors about it because of the secrecy and the bureaucracy, trying to find some of this data. A lot of it, uh, I was told yesterday that nobody knew about Rocky Flats or the 57 fire till the 70s. The museum, which I'm also active in, has got all kinds of newspaper articles about the 57 fire. I was there, I know what happened. It was made known to the public. The 69 fire the same way, and the air response, the air effluent data, and et cetera, was made known to the public. Now, maybe it wasn't made known to everybody. I don't know about the bureaucracy in Washington, but I've dealt with some of that, and I'm dealing right now with FEMA and other people because I was a victim of the floods. The bureaucracy is very hard to deal with. But as a worker and the other thousands of workers that I dealt with, we were informed and knew what we could talk about and would not be able to talk about. It was never the things that keep brought up in the paper about we're not saying what's in the water, we're not saying what's in the air. We did say. Now if somebody that we reported to didn't like it or anything, I never had them come back to me. And I was out there for many years. And in health physics for the first 25, like I say, I did the monitoring, I did the soil, I did the water and et cetera. I never seen that. Everybody's saying they can't obtain the data. Well, I worked with Jaco, Al Hazel, and everybody from the Colorado State Department from day one. We set up the first health physics society in Colorado. We met routinely, routinely. I don't know about the EPA problems that they had dealing with the government and being able to obtain, like you mentioned, reams of data and what was in those reams of data. I know this, when you start reading that data, it's very difficult for the average citizen. In particular, right now there is a subcommittee that I'm on of 27 people that oversees Rocky Flats on a continuous basis. There is with DOE under Scott and other people, a group of people that are routinely monitoring everything at Rocky Flats. Rocky Flats is one of the best monitoring, closest monitoring area that I know of in Colorado and probably in the, in the United States. Ken? There's 1,400 wells, there's all kinds of things. Uh, we can get into this in more detail a bit later, but let's keep it on those sort of structures okay. of compartmentalization. On the compartmentalization, that was Ken Calkins that did that. Yeah. And in turn, we were compartmentalized. Maybe some people couldn't get into those areas. It was a need to know. I mentioned and earlier the need, health need physics to group. Know, could you just kind of clarify? I think when I first heard need to know, I thought that meant you need to know. And it doesn't mean that. It really means something kind of Orwellian. You need if, not to know. If you need to know on the weapon product or something to do with right. the weapon product, the shipments and et cetera, that's very true. I'm wondering, though, if, if part, and one of the things that Nat uh, said in his oral history had to do with sometimes the compartmentalization actually endangered workers because they didn't know things that they might have known. It never endangered me, never endangered any workers that I know of. The workers that were allowed in there were trained and they were compartmentalized. That's true. Okay. I never heard of anybody being blindfolded. I never seen it in all the years that I was there. Let, let's uh, have it may Nat, have happened, but I never seen it. Okay, let's have Nat speak to the issue that you were referring to in your oral history about sometimes people didn't know certain things that it would have been helpful for them to know. Yeah, I think that where the, the um, National Security Act and the environmental rules and regulations sort of intersect and, and may have a little oil and water immiscibility or they don't get along too well is John and Others have brought up the, the waste characterization project about where our regulations required the facilities to always c calculate back the origin of where waste material was being generated. And that was an, an endeavor and a project that Rockwell International and, uh, 
undertook once they decided that they wanted to truly comply with all of the laws that the Resource Conservation Recovery Act or the Superfund laws um, had in place. And it was a tremendous undertaking on their part. It was very detailed. The compartmentalization aspect uh, or conflict or maybe conundrum of how that would work is you would have to start putting piping diagrams down. You would have to start calculating quantities of waste material that would come into the waste holding areas. And, and the really difficult aspect we had dealing with that was in working with DOE and the contractors was they, they just weren't comfortable doing that because um, uh, someone who would want to do the country harm could maybe back calculate from all of that information, the flow material, and reverse engineer the processes or even locations on the plant. Um, and we had very detailed drawings of where all of that stuff was. Some of it was redacted, but very little. They were very forthcoming with that information. But it was a real headache at EPA to try to figure out what do we do with this, as John mentioned, UCNI or unclassified nuclear information in our office. We're not set up like the Department of Energy is. We don't have large vaults and safes and locks on keys and things like that. So we had to go and purchase that to be able to keep the material safe, and we tried to do that. And it, it was funny that John actually found that in a public setting in a, in a community college where it was all laid out there. Um, so environmental laws by nature um, require there to be, as you might hope, an interconnectivity, a web of life kind of perspective of what materials man is making that could impact the environment or harm human health. National security rules are dominantly, predominantly ruled by compartmentalizing that information so as little information is shared with an individual doing a specific job as possible. Now that doesn't mean there weren't people at the plant who didn't know all. There were people at the plant who were very competent and did know a lot. And a lot of those people worked in the environment and human health area because they had to go across several buildings. What they could share at any moment was very scrubbed and very well thought out. Um, once a little bit of information is made available, what is human nature? You want to know more. What's behind that? Well, why is it built that way? Why is the piping from that building going into a wastewater treatment plant that is identified as ma mainly a sanitary plant? And where does that outlet pipe go? So when you want to know more, and you're told, well, I have to, I have to see if I can give you that, you're thinking, oh, they're covering up. There's secrecy there for the sake of minimizing their legal liability or some other kind of liability? Well, maybe not. Maybe they just really need to follow good procedures to figure out what can I release that it will not violate National Security Act requirements. Um, and over time, a lot of that kind of information, the details, started coming to us and coming to the public. Uh, and it wasn't enough. It wasn't fast enough because you always ask that next question. Aha, now that I know this, I'd like to know more. What else can you give? I want to go back a, a ways. Uh, it's so easy to get into the you know more recent stuff, but what Judy had been talking about in terms of some of that early work to really bring to the citizens what was going on, uh, I think was extremely important. I wanted to read uh, what a member of the Lamworth Task Could Force. I just make a comment oh, on sure. the last question. Sure. Um, fairly early on, as we were making contacts in the community. We met Kay Gable. Uh, she was the wife of a worker at Rocky Flats who'd been hired out of high school. He, uh, he worked near furnace pipes uh, with his head very near one of those hot pipes. He was always told that there was no danger to his health. He had no idea that uh, well, he may have felt some of the um, environment impact, but he, he was told he was totally safe. And I don't know who told him that, but that was what he told his wife as well. He died 10 years later with three children and a young wife of brain cancer. His brain uh, during autopsy was then sent to the Los Alamos labs in New Mexico for further study 
they lost his brain. By the time they found it, um, it really was disintegrated, so they couldn't do any testing on it. Um, I'm not sure that all the workers really knew anything about their own safety. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the uh, Lamworth Task Force because I think this was really crucial and some of the work you and the American Friends Service Committee set the stage for that. Uh, one of the things that I realized as I listened to Bill Cohen talk about the Lamworth Task Force was that this was uh, established in 1974, 1975, and it was just early on, right after Watergate, when um, Lamb, uh, Dick Lamb, had just been uh, elected governor and Tim Worth had just been elected uh, 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 congressman. Thank you. Uh, and they got together, they were on an airplane together, just happened to be together, and said, what are we going to do? There's all these people that are talking about how dangerous Rocky Flats is. We've got to do something. So they made the Lamworth Task Force, which was really, I think, the first sort of, you might say, establishment group that uh, was comprised of not only activists, but uh, Rocky Flats workers, and other people that were, you know, trusted in the community. Uh, I just wanted to read what he said in that. He said, so they started back in the 50s burying these barrels on site. And at some point, people at the plant discovered that the barrels were leaking and plutonium was drifting outside the area where they had been buried. So they covered the area. They knew about it for years and they just kept it quiet. That was the big problem, the lack of public knowledge of what was happening what accidents were occurring, what risks were occurring. Just, you know, anyone that might want to react to that? Or I can talk to that. the 903 pad. Okay. The 903 pad was where we did store barrels, carbon tet, perchlor, things of that nature that was used for coolant, coolants in the machining process. We never started the machining process until 1957. Before that, basically speaking, the plutonium, because it was so pyrophoric, you couldn't machine it. We finally worked out a system where we could machine it, but in turn, it did require coolants like trichlor and et cetera. We uh, machined it. It was very pyrophoric, like I said. But when we did, we had a process going in that was to handle that solution. The process didn't work. The decision was made between Washington and the contractor to keep producing the nuclear weapon components, or the other alternative was to stop. Well, we were told to keep producing, so we kept producing. We stored the barrels, and some of them did leak. In fact, quite a few of them leaked. On 903 pad, after they leaked over a period of time, there was some contamination that did go to the east, but not very far. We even put a berm up there to try and stop some of it. We removed the barrels later on, removed the liquid out of them, and shipped the barrels compacted in the center to Idaho and Hanford, the waste. We then took out the waste that we could on the topsoil and we covered what was left there, which there was still some contamination there. We covered that and covered it with asphalt and put four holes around the corners of that asphalt pad for sampling to make sure groundwater didn't get out of there. That was done for quite a few years. On the final decontamination, it was done on the cleanup of the plant in the two in the two thousand year area. Uh, the Trichlor was outside. Trichlor now cannot be used uh, in production of areas. Sunstrain used a lot of it. A lot of people did. It followed the route of asbestos. It was okay at that time, but not now. And in turn, trichlor was a problem. The, uh, where we did, we did the best we could at that time, and we did clean it up the best we could later on. And to my knowledge, all of that dirt was taken out later on during the cleanup and shipped to Idaho. Uh, it was accounted for, but we had the choice of either stopping production, the deterrents that were really, to me, put the Cold War to bed, and without it, we wouldn't have put the Cold War to bed. Uh, so it was a, a decision made by Washington and the contractor to proceed because we didn't have a process that worked. John, would you want to? At the risk of the neighbors and potentially the workers, because that area over by the 903 pad was the east trenches and the mound. And those archive burial sites were spray irrigated over. 
waste stream identification characterization report I was talking about earlier, a lot of the liquid affluent, I'm going to call it liquid because it was sanitary, commercial, industrial, hazardous, and radioactive that went to the sewage treatment plant or 995. And because Rocky Flats was not allowed to discharge off-site, they were supposed to spray irrigate for trans evaporation or percolation into the ground. But one of their permits required that they not spray irrigate over the east trenches, and they did it anyway, and they pled, and Rockwell pled guilty to it in 1992. And it's, it's that type of uh, activity that questions up, questions the east area of the facility where the Jeffco Parkway is expected to go through. And it's been, le it's been uh, determined that it's not contaminated. Uh, it depends on what depth of ground you're talking about and a lot of other issues. So it's not a one word answer. And um, this is the type of uh, issue that, that's being mentioned in that oral history that, and it goes to the compartmentalization too, because my badge at Rocky Flats, I could go anywhere, but there were some guards that would slow me down a little bit. They wouldn't open the gate, what have you. But not everybody at Rocky Flats had a badge that can go everywhere and do it's anything. Very rare. Very rare. So. Isn't that the way it should have been, John? What's that? Because the need to know. With the weapon production, we did have a need to know if we worked in that area. I mentioned earlier the only three groups that really could go anywhere were health physics, fire, and security. And that was because if there was an incident, they could, like any fire department in this area does, they have mutual aid and et cetera, and they go to where the fire was and take care of it. But, I, but I, had, I have an issue with an employee who is working in the non-PSC or non-perimeter security, security zone. Yes. And it's, it's part of the compartmentalization was actually geological as well. And when all of a sudden the solar evaporation ponds were being closed, the mm -hmm. concrete was being mixed and made into a, a blob uh, that collapsed. Uh, these employees that were working over in the non-PSZ zone would go over into the PSC, the 700 area, and start mixing this concrete. And they, they may or may not have been briefed in or made knowledgeable about what was going on. I've heard about the thumb, you know, the thumb test to make sure that this concrete. I mean, Rockwell was a, a kind of a rocket scientist of companies, wasn't it? I mean, working with NASA, and you would think that they'd know how to you know, mix uh, Portland con uh, cement with uh, uh, the sludge from the pond. And when you see them slump, and the Nevada test site say no more because you're sending us, uh, you know, worthless uh, waste loads, um, employees were subjected to, who they didn't know. I didn't know, really, until um, Hartley Alley represented Jim Stone, the former Rocky Flats employee, and 1999, there was quite an exchange between Rockwell and the Department of Energy about what each entity knew, and some of those concretes were giving off, you know, 15,000 times more than a, a normal gamma radiation, nitrates, and I, I can give you the document. It's a court pleading. I don't Rockwell. agree with that, but uh, the, you know, you're saying the, the people that went in from the from the non-PSZ, which was a, a a preliminary security zone, fenced, guarded very tro closely. The people that went in from the outside, they were indoctrinated before they worked on concrete or went into concrete, all of them. And they were badged accordingly with the TLS, with the thermal lucid asymmetries, and they were monitored before they went in, as they went in and as they came out. True? I have no idea. But, but you weren't there, and that's, that's the difference. That's correct. And if I was there, and a lot of other people were there. There was thousands but of these good are, workers there that did these follow are intelligent the rules. people, and you would not expect them to do the old thumb test on these concrete blocks. I wouldn't. I, I think we're not going to resolve this no. issue here, and it's getting no, a little bit far away from secrecy. But Thank one you, of the things I'd like to I'd like to bring out that I think this whole interchange reminds me of, and and ha has disturbed me throughout doing the oral histories, we get, we get stuck in these uh, very important environmental issues, but we forget about, it, it distracts all of us from what was really being produced at Rocky Flats. 
And it also distracts us from having a really important conversation about did this country really need 70,000 uh, nuclear bombs to, to be in hydrogen bombs? And that's an issue that isn't even really resolved yet. Uh, we have cut back, we're going in a, in a good direction. But I felt, you know, one of the things that this, this uh, quote from Daniel Ellsberg, which was a quote from 1978, the plant had been operational for more than 25 years. He said, I found that on every program I did on Denver, one of the not one of the interviewers was aware of what Rocky Flats did. One interview said, well, why are you against nuclear power? And I said, do you know what they do at Rocky Flats? And he said, well, isn't it a nuclear power plant? And I said, the only power they produce at Rocky Flats is the power to end life on Earth. And I think somehow or other, uh, we, we, ha we don't even like to think about uh, what the plant actually produced. I also wanted to read uh, the statement from one uh, manager of Rocky Flats that uh, talked to me at length about how patriotic he felt working there. And then he said, I never felt like I was being a ghoul in the world that was set to destroy the world. I hoped these weapons would never be used. And that's, I think, something everyone agrees on. Ordinary people, he said, just have no concept of how destructive these weapons are. It should have been on television. These things, they're awesome, they're unbelievable. There's enough there to destroy the world 10 times over. Sometimes I worry that in, in looking at all of the, the environmental and human costs of manufacturing the weapons, we, we get distracted from looking at how are we gonna get control of them. And I wonder if anyone else wants to comment on that on the panel. Could I uh, just mention uh, it was Pam Solo and I that went to meet with uh, then prospective Governor Lamb and uh, Congressman Worth and asked them to please set up a task force after they were elected, which they eventually did. And Dr. John Cobb, who was a member of our, our Rocky Flats Action Group and our American Friends Service Committee committee program committee, uh, was placed on that task force. Uh, Dr. Cobb helped us learn a lot about uh, what low-level radiation was like. I think we all knew about x-rays and gamma rays um, and uh, things that penetrate right through your body. Low-level radiation was totally different and we didn't know anything about this. Um, it can be ingested through your mouth, through your nose. It can get through a cut uh, through the lungs, it gets into your bloodstream. Low-level radiation can be one tiny little particle you can never see or uh, experience in any way with your senses. Uh, so small, almost invisible, or it is invisible, really. Radiation can be inv is invisible. But uh, one little particle could get into your body somewhere. It gives off um, these radioactive rays uh, it creates cell, extra cell growth and can create a cancer anywhere. But it, it's also attracted to your gonads, your sex organs. And so uh, you can get genetic mutations somewhere down the line. Um, this is a, a very dangerous substance. I wanted to comment that the, uh, Ken said, yes, there was publicity about the plant after the 57 fire. There was a tiny article in the uh, newspaper that said, yes, there was a, f a big fire out there, but the public was perfectly safe. There was never any, uh, any release of radiation off-site the plant. Uh, there was no, no problem. You, can, you uh, never had any health uh, dangers on the public and that we shouldn't worry about anything. This was said after every single fire and there were over 2,000 fires between uh, 52 and, or 53 and uh, 70, 78 when uh, we wrote our booklet. Uh, many people didn't know anything and we were told not to know anything. 
So having this task force was a very important thing. Uh, the public did need to know. And uh, they began to hold hearings and uh, uh, expose some of these things that were going on. Of course, uh, the whole idea of nuclear weapons, we often thought was the boys are playing with their toys. They want uh, an increasingly dangerous way to destroy the earth. And another secret, I think even today, is we don't know, most people don't know that there are 50 intercontinental ballistic missiles in uh, Minutemen silos that are on active alert uh, in Northeast Colorado right today. And uh, who knows where they're being aimed right now? And does anyone uh, really take some responsibility for that? Uh, I think we should, we should begin to uh, wind up. I, I wanted to say just a little bit about what I noticed, uh, and I, I can pick it up here too. Um, there's a language that we all get into, and at first when I was first doing interviews with the workers, I sort of thought it was just worker lingo. But then I began to realize that I was picking up on it myself. Like, uh, even something as simple as hot and cold, um, you know, people who've never worked in a nuclear facility don't really realize that hot is radioactive and cold is non-radioactive. And some of the, the words that are used in the nuclear industry, we've all picked up, you know, we nuke our coffee. Um, we, uh, the, the uh, essential core of the, the, the core of the, the weapon, the plutonium core, is called the button, which astonished me. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole language of sort of minimizing and uh, a feeling that I, I believe is we're trying to control something that we desperately fear might, might not be able to be controlled. But anyway, I wonder if any, either any of you have thoughts about this language and whether it's a good thing or not a good thing. I know the language because I used it forever. Yeah. yeah. And hot and cold is right. And there's a button. A button is simply a 2 kg ingot, basically speaking, that is used later on to be full poured and formed into a final weapon component. Do you the, think, Ken, do you think that the security regulations where early on you couldn't even use words like plutonium, do you think that no. that helped I, I was able to use plutonium, and I think you'll see plutonium in a lot of newspaper articles. The museum now has of reams and reams of pictures and data. And but early uh, on, that I was, was not never, the case. I was never told, like I say, uh, you mentioned the plutonium. I got plutonium in me. Uh, and in turn, uh, some of the early workers, a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm even a little older than you, so I, I, I'm, I've lived my life, and I lived it pretty damn well. And in turn, I see by the applause a lot of times that there's a lot of negative feelings about Rocky Flats and also about weapons and things of this nature. Without the weapons, I was called back to service again when the Cuban crisis hit. Do you think we would have bluffed out Khrushchev if we didn't have the deterrent that we put together at Rocky Flats and the other nuclear plants? I don't. There's a lot of times when you see that. Thank you. There's a lot of times when you see that. Right now we're starting to see it in the Ukraine. We're seeing it in Iran. We're seeing it in North Korea. We're seeing it in China. And a lot of the bureaucracy don't ever say about what some of the things are like right now, we didn't know what was happening in Ukraine. We didn't know the World Trade Towers were going to be hit because of lack of security someplace on the Taliban's part. I don't want the lack of security to put the United States in that position. I really enjoy the freedom that we got. And I enjoy the people that have put forth the effort, the military and et cetera, to put forth the deterrence and things that we have to fight that off. Freedom isn't completely free. Every single empire that I can go back in history failed. Romans, Moors, Spanish, English, all of them. Why? Because the people finally thought, well, we'll take care of this, we'll take care of that. But the deterrence or the fighting for freedom isn't easy. Believe me, I've been there, and a lot of people in the audience probably been there. There's some Rocky Flats people in the audience here. 
we Again, weren't I a think bunch this of fools. We did our into job. A wonderful wind up uh, time, which just fits where our time. We need to open it up okay. for questions. But uh, do you want to finish your thought, and I'll give everybody else the well, The simple thought so. I think is that with Rocky, without Rocky Flats and the other 14 nuclear sites, and Rocky Flats right now is clean according to the bureaucracy standards, the EPA, to the best of my knowledge. The federal bureau, the federal government, and the state of Colorado government, and I asked Leroy Moore yesterday, can he name one incident in the last numerous years where there was anything released from Rocky Flats, and he couldn't. The reason being is there is a subcommittee overseeing all that. But the main thing Rocky Flats did, and I think the legacy is going to be, the people that worked out there were normal, everyday people, your neighbors. They did their job the best they could. They maintained the secrecy of the weapon product and the weapons the best they could. They talked about the environment. It was open, and I kept it open as well. There wasn't any secrecy for me to say there isn't any. I don't believe there is a health hazard, OK? okay. East okay. of the I think, plant. I think uh, we need to move on. I live Each east of, of the us plant. Have, another, have an opportunity to get one, one statement in. Uh, John, do you want to give one? One and only one. That was a mischaracterization about the conversation at the panel last night between Ken and Leroy Moore. Leroy, Leroy Moore did have a response, and I just wanted to make that point. What was his response? I only had one thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was that he couldn't come up with an answer. I think we down here. We want to wind up and open this up for uh, questions. Uh, Judy, would you like to say anything? In um, Ken says that uh, they were totally open. Uh, you know, in 1973, Al Hazel found a tritium in the Broomfield water supply perf uh, completely by accident. He had never been told about that. The plant said that they didn't have it, and they didn't even know they had it. So the monitoring was never uh, complete. And things gradually started coming out. It, it took the public a very long time to, even those of us who really want to know, of course the people that live near the plant didn't necessarily want or ever find out what was going on with them. And though many of them experienced health uh, hazards. There's a Mormon family that lived nearby that uh, grew all their own crops and had their own well, dug their own well. Um, Many of them are very ill. Uh, there's uh, secrecy today, I feel. Uh, much, uh, many cover-ups have happened. Even though many people at the plant may have known, the rest of us didn't know. And there's still a lot of known, not known. Uh, some of the studies that were proposed to be uh, conducted are Dr. John Cobb that we knew. Um, had a study on autopsies of uh, people that lived around the plant. The, um, when he started doing the gonad studies of, of uh, potential uh, birth defects, that study, uh, EPA suddenly cut off all their funding. And I might it just, never happened. I, I might just uh, say here that uh, we're going to have panels tomorrow that will look at health effects and right. contamination, and I think they're really important um, uh, tomorrow afternoon. Nat, but I, like I just wanted to say they, they want to build a playground uh, at that plant. There are no signs around the plant that tell you what kind of exposure you might have if you went on to that plant. It's not <laughs> conscionable. Nat, how about you making some final so I started out the discussion about talking about my, my dear father and his, his service to this country. I also graduated from a military academy and was in consideration of the Rickenbacker Nuclear Navy program because my campus um, had a nuclear reactor on site and the whole nuclear pro engineering program there was run by Dr. Meyer Degani who was heavily embedded in, in part of the Manhattan Project. I chose not to go into that program because of a debate and an argument with my indoctrination officer about nuclear waste and um, our discussion about 
whether or not it, we had the technology and the methodologies to, to be safely managing that material. And the, be, the end all and be all facility, in my mind as an engineer, was the waste isolation pilot plant until just recently when they had their accidents and the, and the radioactive leakage. And I was very disappointed because I actually did have faith and trust that it was secure and that it was the technological answer to uh, nuclear waste and perhaps uh, a, a future energy source for that. And I think that that's a very important lesson for us to think about in this whole context of secrecy. As time went on, as time went on since World War II or even before that to now, um, we had all kinds of historical events shape our perceptions and our acceptance of what the government tells us and what information it shares. Um, I think Vietnam shook the core of the American public's trust in the government and the things that it does. And I think that's a good thing because it pushes all of us, me as an Environmental Protection Agency representative, anyone else who's ever worked for a government agency or even uh, a citizen's watch, watchdog group. It pushes us all to push each other um, to earn trust because I've, I, it, yeah, um, I, I cherish that phrase that President Ronald Reagan gave us, trust but verify. And I think that that pressure and demand for information and trust is on us more now than ever in the information age. And I think that the two words trust and secrecy, they don't always go hand in hand. And we are just held to a higher standard today to earn trust, to share information, and to try to work through some of these very difficult issues more collaboratively. Okay. I think that's a, that's a good note for us to close as panelists, and uh, I think we can open it up for questions now. Uh, hopefully. Did John want to say something? Oh, pardon? John have a closing? Did, I, did I you? Closed. Yes. Oh. He closed. Yes. Give me one thing to oh. say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, anybody in the audience? We have ushers with uh, microphones. Uh, and again, if uh, you have questions, it, it would be a good thing if you could do them briefly and uh, indicate which panelists you would like to answer them. Uh, right over here, the, the lady here. Hi, I'd like to um, address this question to Ken. I heard um, you say that you feel, or you know, that the weapons produced at Rocky Flats made us safer um, and that we won the Cold War. I was taught that in school and I believed that until I actually started looking at the chronological events um, that took place with the United States developing the bomb, the atomic bomb, in um, 19, starting in 1942 and dropping, first testing in 1945, then dropping the bombs and killing many civilians in Japan in August of 1945. And at, at this point, the Soviet Union, um, from what I've learned, had not developed the nuclear bomb. Um, following World War II, the United States started testing um, with exploding nuclear bombs above ground, exposing civilians to radio radio radioactivity, radiation, um, causing many health, health problems. Um, they weren't told. Um, Could you get and to your still question? Soviet Union had not, <laughs> sorry. Um, I forget the exact number. I believe around 100 um, nuclear tests before the Soviet Union. So my feeling after um, looking at those numbers is that it was not a Cold War or an arms race, rather that it was the United States bullying the Soviet Union into catching up. And Ken, I would just like you to respond 
um, how, um, how you feel about that. This gets us beyond secrecy, but maybe, Ken, if you could give a short response. Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what the question is, but as far as the deterrent and the number of weapons and et cetera, the Soviet Union was working before we actually exploded Trinity, which was in New Mexico, our first test, which was a fat man. And in turn, they were working on a nuclear weapon at that time. A lot of people were. But we were the first ones to accomplish it. Uh, the scientists, like I say, and the, some of the people that got some of those secrets out of us were from them 350 spies, if you want to call them. Most of them were Americans that the Soviet got that data from. Do I believe it ended the Cold War? Yes. Uh, do I believe that we should have had them? Yes. I never want to use them. I don't feel they should ever be used. And most of the people that have designed and built them now don't feel. But they feel the deterrent is what ended the Cold War and saved a lot of people. And also during the end of World War II, it saved a lot of people. If we would have invaded Japan, the destruction of just incendiary weapons or normal warfare weapons completely destroy a populace. Uh, Ham Hamburg, Germany was a good example. Winds of 110 miles an hour were caused by the fires, drawing oxygen into the fire. It was destroyed. Uh, granted, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was tragic. And I hope we never have to go through it again. Nobody. But I also don't want to be on the receiving end first. I think the only way to stop wars with people that want to start them is have a deterrent that stops them. I, I don't know what other answer there is. And anybody thinks differently, uh, maybe they ought to talk to the people that hit the World Trade Towers. Maybe they ought to talk to China now that's building aircraft carriers and nuclear weapons. Maybe they ought to talk to Iran. Maybe they ought to talk to the young man in Korea. Uh, I don't want no war. None of the workers at Rocky Flats wanted war, but the secrecy was maintained to try and prevent the war. Any other questions from other people? Right down Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Judith? I'm really trying hard to figure out how to work this into secrecy, <laughs> and I'm just going to go ahead. I really appreciate the panel. And, and the weekend. And Judy Danielson, I really appreciated it when you brought up the missiles of Colorado. All of them have pits from Rocky Flats inside them. And they're sort of secret because people have forgotten all about it. But uh, I'm with the Colorado Coalition for the Prevention of Nuclear War, in addition to the Peace Center in Boulder. And we work with those missiles trying to get them at least off of hair trigger alert. And you know what's going on with the airmen and women right now who are cheating on tests and using drugs and having, uh, being bored and having really low morale. Plus, I'd like to, the question I want to ask, do any of you have any idea of the relationship of the 8,000 fracking wells and the 50 missile silos all of which are in the same general area. There was an earthquake just last week in Greeley. What's the relationship and what can we do? And is, the, is there research and is it secret? I don't know whether I, anyone on this panel I, I has I don't that know about any research up there, but it certainly needs to be done. I know that at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, they were pumping waste into the ground, much like the fracking uh, sites are pumping a lot of uh, very high pressure water and chemicals and sand in. And uh, it began causing earthquakes at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal and it was finally stopped because uh, you know, this can get into the water supply and everything else. So uh, those studies certainly should be going on around the nuclear, uh, the missile silos, though I think the, mus why do we have these? Why are we, who are we aiming at now? Shouldn't they just be deactivated? Um, uh, much more important than uh, trying to do some studies about fracking, though I think that's important too. Well, I'm impressed with the technology, and we've made leaps and bounds, but what I'm worried about too is like with the uh, coastline of the United States, an oceanographer uh, in a lecture said that less than 1% of the U.S. coastline has been mapped, and yet we have companies wanting to do exploration. So why don't we do it the other way around? Let's do the mapping of the coastlines and 
the areas that want to be fracked and whatever else, and then make a decision about what can be done. We're kind of always doing things backwards, and, but that's capitalism. <laughs> with, with that, I, I, uh, one other question up there. I value the uh, drawing attention to trust and verify. My question is, how do we proceed now to regain trust if we've lost that regarding Rocky Flats without verifying? And how do we verify in the midst of secrecy? Um, Who would like to I, respond? I think the subcommittee, for one, is doing a lot of that verification under DOE. They have taken many, many samples. They're continuing to do it. There hasn't, we've lived within all of the laws from the federal and the state and EPA and et cetera. There hasn't been any release from Rocky Flats. Even during the flood, there was a lot of questions, the flood of September 13th. Uh, it is being monitored on a continuous basis, and there is data available to the public through that subcommittee for one and through the government for another. Uh, I don't know how much you want to sample. You know, they're sampling 1,400 uh, wells and all let's kinds give, of areas. Let's give someone else, yeah. anyone else on the panel want to address that? Well, I think Ken and I agree on this issue. That subcommittee is a publicly open process. Uh, it is often very hard to keep up with it and, and dedicate time to that. But if, if people want information, that is the venue to do it and the information is shared what you might find is that you don't think there's enough information or that you disagree with the interpretation of the data or um, that you're, you're not sure you trust everything that's even coming through there. I think what you'll find, however, is that it's, a, it's an eclectic group of individuals. They all come from different backgrounds and um, they all have different positions, so I would encourage you to get in, involved with this. What is the name of the sub, the formal name of the subcommittee? There's only two from Rocky Flats on that subcommittee, which I'm one. The rest are your mayors, it, your government, the, and the state, and et cetera. It's the stewardship, Excuse the name me? of the subcommittee. It's the stewardship, uh, the name of the subcommittee he's asking. It's, uh, it's the Rocky Flats subcommittee to oversee. It's stewardship, the stewardship council. council is it not? Um, yeah, and then from there, you can take it from there. If, if you will, I, I served on that council when it was um, first started, started and yeah. inevitably, there are people like, Harvey, who's had his hand up <laughs> and has something very important to say, who have been on that, and they will inevitably ask the next question, like we talked about before. Oh, good, that's good information. What does it mean? And does it tell me this? Am I safe? That's usually the question that you're going to ask. In 2004, John Southers, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Colorado, offered any federal agency to come and look at, I'm not sure what, maybe the grand jury material that you're concerned about, as I am and the other um, case file information. And I don't know that any, any federal agency took up the offer, but when I interviewed with NIOSH last January, I asked them, I gave them a copy of the letter and asked them to consider contacting the present U.S. attorney to take that U.S. attorney up on looking at all the information that's available that was offered, what, 10 years ago. We are out of time now, and we have, let's have, okay, yes. Hello, Harvey. for that clarification. I just, yes. I just want to remind people of the uh, session that's coming up at 3.30 here. Uh, it's uh, 
imagining the real, it's uh, art in Rocky Flats, and uh, that, that should be a very interesting session. And then the two tomorrow afternoon, I'm sure many people in this room will be interested in. One is on health, long-term health issues uh, with regard to Rocky Flats, and the other is on contamination. So thank you all panelists, and thank you audience for being here.